Hi, everybody. My name is Dan Dunsky, and I'm the executive producer of The Agenda with Steve Pagan, and uh, here today to talk foreign affairs with Janice Stein, the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs, and also TVO's foreign affairs analyst. Say hello, Janice. Good morning to you, Donna, and to all our TVO friends. Good morning. Uh, Janice, uh, we really should talk about Egypt. Um, yeah. I'm not sure really there's much else to talk about, but we may, if we have a bit of time, maybe we can talk about the, um, the renewed peace process uh, between Israel and Palestinians. Egypt, it's hard to overestimate how much a disaster this is. Um, and I, I'm going to assume from your nodding that you agree with that. Uh, let's start with what happened yesterday. Why did the military feel that well, feel. Why did the military do what it did and uh, remove all the demonstrators, the pro Morsi demonstrators, from various camps in uh, Cairo? So, for the military, um, it was clear that these encampments, uh, two of them, at, you know, uh, at opposite ends of Cairo, really, uh, were becoming more and more deeply embedded. Uh, they were really becoming tent cities in the in the heart of Cairo. So they had electricity, shops, uh, amusement parks uh, for children, and they were becoming, for all intents and purposes, permanent politically. And that's what the military were not prepared to tolerate. Now the truly astounding thing you're done is that uh, uh, governments all over the world had put pressure on the military to use minimal force. And what they had said was that they would use a siege strategy. I'm not sure that would have been any better, but that they would cut off water and food uh, and allow safe passage out of the camp. That's not what they did yesterday. They functionally stormed the camp. They did not provide safe corridors uh, out of either camp from everything we know. And there is a very high casualty, uh, over 500 killed, uh, over 3,500 injured and wounded. It was a very violent uh, end to, the de to these demonstrations. And as you said, and I agree with you, there are really damaging long-term political consequences, not only from doing this, but from the way they did it. Okay, let's hold off on that. I just want you—you you cited the figures, and I, I the figures that I'm looking at right now that are uh, at least Correct. independently verified by the BBC that I'm seeing agree with that. We should point out that the Muslim Brotherhood itself does say that several thousand people, two thousand, yes. I believe, is the latest figure that they're saying were yes. killed. Uh, but the ones that we can confirm certainly about five, between five and six hundred people killed and several thousand injured. Right. Why do you suppose that the army decided to do it this way? Now, we should point out that the army was talking to the Brotherhood, and there were, there were attempts, uh, in large measure brokered by the United States, is my understanding, to try to find a negotiated settlement here. Yeah, so so there remind, were remind, remind everybody, just to take two seconds, remind everybody what happened June 30th, how we got here, and what the negotiations were that were going on. June 30th was the, the military ultimatum, frankly, to President Morsi yeah, to step down, to have a broadly inclusive government or step down. He refused the military, essentially took over and forced President Morsi from office. President Morsi was elected in a free and fair election, more or less, with 51% of the vote. Uh, but there were millions of people in the streets demonstrating and calling for his removal. And the Egyptian military said they, they responded uh, to the Egyptian public. Uh, since then, uh, the pro-Morsi supporters have organized and demonstrated in the streets. These two large encampments uh, were in fact the locus, the epicenter of the demonstrations. At the same time, negotiations were going on, mediated through the United States, but also, and more effectively, by Qatar, between the government of Egypt, uh, General al-Sisi and his representatives, and representatives of the Muslim Brotherhood, for a non-violent solution. They came, they were deadlocked. Uh, and they were deadlocked over the critical demand of the, of the Brotherhood that President Morsi be restored to office if only for a day. 
uh, and the military refused to do that. Uh, they have their charges have now been laid against President Morsi for um, uh, an issue uh, during the original revolutionary period, and the and the multi Egyptian military absolutely refused. Now I think it's important to understand that the military is itself divided. Uh, there is a more hardline wing that historically has hated the Brotherhood. Uh, for 30 years in the same way that the Brotherhood has historically hated the military. Frankly, these are two non-democratic organizations, the most powerful in Egypt, uh, who hate each other. There's a 30-year-old history of enmity between them, and they were, they were not interested. Uh, the militant wings on both sides were not interested in any kind of negotiated solution to this. They could not see their way forward. The military warned three days ago, four days ago, that they were going to move against these camps, but no one expected uh, the violence uh, that the military actually used. And that says to me that it was the more hardline element in the military uh, that ultimately won the day in the internal conflict going on. Tell me something, how is it possible that the, the Brotherhood, the Ikhwan, didn't uh, understand their relative position of power in this? Well, I, they do understand their relative position of power, so let me disagree uh, with a question. Um, they are uh, uh, an opposition movement, uh, very skilled at going underground, uh, very skilled at organizing, uh, and actually committed to nonviolence, have been committed to nonviolence ever since 1981 when they engaged in targeted assassinations. Including, uh, the, including, including president the president of Egypt. President Anwar al-Sadat. Uh, they certainly have splinter organizations who have used violence, but the mainline, the Juan, the Brotherhood, has been committed to nonviolence. Now, they did not, they were not able really to make the transition successfully to governors. That's not a problem unique to the Brotherhood. Uh, it's often very hard for an opposition movement that it, whose whole culture is based on opposing uh, to make that transition to the government. And you really saw that uh, in Morsi's presidency, where he didn't understand, if anything, what he didn't understand, he was elected by 51% of the population. That's a narrow mandate in Egypt. He did not treat it that way. He wasn't inclusive in his policies. He forced a constitution through uh, that actually worried many people. Uh, but the Muslim Brotherhood is now, since June the 30th, returned to its historic role. I wish they're very skilled and very good. So what happened yesterday is not the end of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's the beginning. And in fact, we saw them call for large demonstrations in Egypt today. Um, I would be very surprised if some did not heed their call and go into the streets. Uh, and they will return to what they are very, very, very good at. Organizing, um, fundraising, uh, essentially an opposition strategy. The challenge for the military was always to bring the Brotherhood back into the government after June the 30th. And they failed, and I think the Brotherhood, um, you know, the Brotherhood wins every time they provoke the military to use extreme force and violence. And you're already seeing it on the blogs in Egypt. Uh, the, the, the liberals, who are a small minority of the Egyptian population, to the extent we can gauge it at all, who supported the military, yeah, now this is something that I do have to talk to you about. Uh, it, it, it is, it's, it, we have to understand, that, that I was reading something quite interesting actually, that liberals in Egypt are not exactly liberals as we would understand in the West. Uh, I know that's a contentious thing to say, and I, I have a quote that I'd like to read in a little bit. But do you not find it strange that uh, the liberals, uh, liberals and secularists, who were instrumental in the original uh, Arab Spring uprising in Egypt two years ago against the military governorship of uh, Mubarak at the time, or premiership of Mubarak, uh, are now marching arm in arm with the military once again. It, or, or it, it really does surprise me. Does it not surprise you? No. 
Uh, no, actually, it doesn't surprise me because most of the historical precedents we have uh, would suggest that a small group of liberals and secularists, of, and that's what we're talking about in Egypt, when squeezed uh, between the conservatives and the more radical elements. That's the whole of European history from 1848 until 1939. Ultimately choose to go with the more conservative element uh, because they are more alarmed uh, by those uh, on the left than they are on the right. Now left-right categories don't fit in Egypt, but if you treat this small group of liberal secularists uh, as the filling in the sandwich between the military and the brotherhood, uh, when forced to confront a choice, which they didn't have to do February, in, in January of 2011, but they did on June the 30th, 2013, when confronted with a choice uh, between the military and the brotherhood, they went with the military. Now, yesterday's events are shaking that group up again. So you had Al Baradai, um, you know, a westernizer, resign in protest. He could not stay in the government. He felt personally compromised. Many of the Egyptian human rights organizations that, uh, you know, who blog uh, and whose material is more accessible outside Egypt than others are now saying they're horrified by the military. So you have a pulling back. How representative do you think of Egyptian society at large are these organizations? Is El Barade? Are these? Is this a very small minority that we're talking about? Yes, uh, I've always said that El Barade. People thought of him as a possible president of Egypt, uh, and I never thought that in an election he could win. He's rep He's he's actually. Um, viewed with suspicion by Egyptians. He spent most of his life outside the country. He's a Western, you know, he's regarded as a Westernizer, corrupted by foreign influences. This is a small minority. We can't put a number on it, um, but it's, uh, you know, I can't hazard a guess, but it is a small minority. The majority of Egyptians um, are Muslim, many of them devout, but do not support an Islamizing agenda. Uh, that the Muslim Brotherhood has. Uh, they did not, when they voted in a very close election between somebody who was Prime Minister under the Mubarak regime, so should have been hateful right. uh, in a post-revolutionary environment, frankly. And only lost by 2%. Only lost by 2%. This, uh, you know, the Prime Minister got 49% of the Egyptian vote, which really tells you that the broad center of Egyptian public opinion, uh, it wants a government which is restrained, um, which is Muslim, but which is respectful of a broad range of expression of how you live your Islam, and grew increasingly uncomfortable with Morsi, and that's what we saw in the streets at the end of June. You okay, know, the so idea, the let, idea let, let, let at just... the end of June would have been if Morsi could have created a wall-to-wall -wall government. It wasn't great that the military forced out somebody who won in a democratic election. Uh, well, that's the understatement. It would have been absolutely the best outcome would have been yep. a, 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 national, a government of national unity with Morsi right. at the head of it. That's right. But he was unwilling. He, he was unwilling to do it. compromise. And that, again, how do you understand that? And that was his strategic mistake. How do you understand that? That is, I think, that cultural formation of somebody who had spent years and years and years in opposition. And by the way, was not responsible for political strategy either. Was the number two choice right. to run rather than the first. So he was the organizational guy uh, in the Brotherhood rather he was than... The he was the compromise candidate because the uh, the head was not, was deemed uh, unable to... Yeah, he was not allowed to... Now let me just pick up on something. So you've described a highly polarized society. Um, and the Actually not. I've described a society which has a big broad center, but okay. the political activists are highly polarized. The Brotherhood and the military are highly polarized in an ocean that is actually has a very big broad center. Okay, fair enough, but in, in a country that lacks the kinds of institutions to allow these that broad center to represent it, 
you end up having a polarized politics, I suppose right. is the better way for me to say it. Right. So the, the attempt of getting the Brotherhood into government was the, was the big promise here of the last, of the last year. Uh, and, it, and obviously it was a promise that people were looking at um, similar to what has been going on in Turkey. And the hope was that you would have a moderate uh, Islamic government similar to what's been going on in Turkey. And I don't want to discuss Turkey right now. But what, has the, what have the events of the past month, six weeks, and especially yesterday now done for the idea of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, being interested in representative politics? Well, I, I think you, you, know, you began our discussion I'm on, a, I'm on an apocalyptic tone, really, uh, and I, I agree that the, the consequences of this use of force in the way that the government did yesterday, uh, you know, martial law, fundamentally, Egypt is now under martial law, arrests of thousands of brotherhood leaders from everything we know, is crippling uh, to creating a space for the Brotherhood to come back into the political process. And that was the one thing that had to happen if Egypt was going to go forward uh, in a more democratic fashion. And it's the one thing that they have now made extremely difficult. If you're a Brotherhood leader, why would you believe the military? that uh, if you came back uh, out into the open, if you moved away from an underground opposition and once again came out into the open, that you wouldn't have anything but a token role in government given the way uh, the military is acting. So I don't think what happened yesterday is marginal or trivial. I think it's very serious. I think there is, it makes the road back very, very difficult, and it actually shows the, you know, the limits of the Egyptian military on the one hand, and the limits of everybody else's leverage. Uh, not only those in the United States and the European Union, but even those in the Arab world uh, who are pleading with the Egyptian military and not to go down this road. Well, okay, just before we expand the discussion to the United States and to the Gulf states, and by the way, we should point out that there were Plenty of Gulf of, of Arab countries who were actually highly supportive of what the military did. One yesterday. in particular, one in particular, and that is the Saudis, right. uh, who encouraged the Egyptian military uh, to shut down the Brotherhood. They have historically, um, you know, intense dislike of the Brotherhood too, largely because they see the Brotherhood as rivals to their claim that they are the authentic expression of Islam through the Wahhabi tradition. Okay, so just before we go there, and, just, and I do want to talk about the United States because you can actually, I, I, I think that this is a disaster for the United States as well, but um, hold on there, I, I, just to what you just pointed out, so we now have a situation where the Brotherhood, which does speak to the aspirations of millions, tens of millions of Egyptians, yes. is now, does not, for a generation, two generations potentially see a way back into the political process. That can hardly be a positive development for Egypt. No, it's extremely negative. Um, it's, you know, it's very difficult then to imagine this group of brotherhood leaders coming back into a political process that's orchestrated by this group of military leaders. You know, it's difficult to remember even uh, as recently as six weeks ago, but General al-Sisi was appointed by President Morsi. President Morsi trusted him. He removed uh, General Tantawi, who was uh, Mubarak's appointee, uh, and he had confidence and trust in this military leadership. There is now such hatred between the two groups, frankly, there's no other word. Very difficult to think that this generation of Muslim Brotherhood leaders will come back in, and that's a long-term structural obstacle to Egypt moving along a path toward any kind of democracy. You okay. can't go around the Brotherhood, but you can't go through them. You have to make space for them, and the military has failed this critical, critical challenge. I want to, uh, Janice, we have only about five, seven minutes left, and I do want to talk about the United States, because historically, I, I know that the importance of the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia in this, but obviously, when, when there is a crisis like this, all eyes do turn to Washington. And obviously, uh, Egypt, and the, through the vehicle of the aid it receives, from the United States has been a linchpin of American security policy in the Middle East for 30 years now. Um, Barack Obama, I, I'm quite certain that, I, uh, that his supporters would not have imagined that he was as much of a realist as he's turning out to be. 
Uh, and I know he's trying to chart a middle course in this, and especially as somebody pointed out, when you follow George W. Bush, there's a lot to be said for having a more modest uh, foreign policy. But I want to read something that uh, Peter Beiner, whom you know, the American uh, foreign policy and uh, writer, wrote. He said, uh, Obama's attempts to find a middle path has produced the worst of all outcomes. As yesterday's events make gruesomely clear, our supposed leverage with the Egyptian military is a fiction, but we've also destroyed whatever limited influence we may have had with the Brotherhood. To anyone in the Muslim world who needed convincing, it now looks unmistakably clear that the United States favors democracy in the Middle East when and only when our side wins. If you're an Islamist who has now watched the United States wink at coups against democratically elected Islamist governments in Algeria and Egypt, and sought to foment one among the Palestinians after Hamas's democratic election in 2006. The message is clear. Elections are for chumps. Go get your AK-47. So I don't think that's a fair comment by Peter. Um, only in the sense that uh, I think he's really overstating um, U.S. influence. Uh, let, let's be clear. Uh, the United States never had much influence with the Brotherhood. Uh, this okay. is, I agree. Yeah. Uh, so we, once we understand that, the only institution that the United States had any influence with was the Army. And the reason for that is the $1.3 billion worth of military aid that goes from the United States to the Egyptian military every year. Now, if you look at the four-week wait to move against these camps, that four-week wait is largely a result of intense discussions between the U.S. military and the Egyptian military saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and the Egyptian military saying, we know our own interests, right? Uh, and ultimately, as I said, the hardliners in the Egyptian military won out. Uh, but because the United States was not able to determine the final military decision, one, doesn't say they have no influence, uh, and secondly, it's not clear that if they had broken off relationships early, cut off military aid, that we wouldn't have had what we had yesterday two or three weeks ago. Yeah, except for the fact, Janice, that had the United States uttered one word, they would have, and that word being coup, uh, back six meant, weeks ago, had they called it a coup, they would have had influence with the Brotherhood. And they probably still would have had the same amount of influence with the military as they ended up having yesterday. I don't think that's right, because if they had used the word coup, they were, by law, forced to cut off the $1.3 billion worth of military aid. That's the end of their influence with the military. So I don't know that that's the end of their influence. It's, it, 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 there's always the prospect of that influence coming back. Yeah, um, but you know, when you do that, um, fundamentally, all those lines of communication between the American military and the Egyptian military, many of whom knew each other very well, are cut, number one, at a critical moment. Two, and you're doing that in order to grow your influence with the Brotherhood. That's a very tenuous bet at the best. Uh, because you could argue that as soon as this particular crisis is over, the Brotherhood has no love lost for the United States and never will, frankly. I, I think the real message behind this is not that Obama failed. That's almost too easy and that's why I don't like, I don't agree with Peter. It's the United States has no cards to play here. It has no leverage in Egypt. Uh, all it can do is look on with horror. Uh, like that's all the, the, the Europeans can do, it's all the Qataris can do, who after all uh, promised significant amount of financial aid right after this happened, along with the Saudis. They had no influence either. As a matter of fact, they offered more, we should, that is a very good point, the Gulf states offered more in aid than the annual United States contribution, further, further decreasing American leverage in Egypt. Yeah, but it came from two different places, the Gulf aid. It's important to see. Right. It came from the Qataris, who um, were trying to mediate, and the Saudis, who were urging the Egyptian military to move aggressively against the Brotherhood. Ultimately, this is an Egyptian, you know, this is what uh, the Egyptian, the politics of this played out inside the military in Cairo. The military did what it thought it needed to do to survive and protect itself. And I think the rest of us have to understand the days when what would happen in Cairo was dictated in Washington or London are long gone. That's a kind of imperialist view of Egypt. 
And we need to say quite honestly, there's not much we can do about this, but we regret it. Now, it's, you know, Obama's frankly done that. The interesting question will be, what does he do about the military aid going forward? He's already can they've already canceled the exercises. Right. So if you so in other words, if you've got no leverage or very little leverage, what's the point of spending one point three billion dollars a year? That's right. If you give and so that's to me gonna be the critical decision which will be made by Congress in the fall. What happens um, to the military aid package? Uh, do you ex post facto give legitimacy to what the Egyptian military did yesterday and today? That's a hard, hard decision. So, uh, contrary to what I started saying, you've you've you you've actually convinced me that this has le or you're suggesting to me that this has less to do with hard-hearted or hard-headed uh, foreign policy realism and much more to do with never mind having a series of bad choices. Really, whatever choice the United States uh, had was really minimal influence had minimal influence anyway. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's a hard one for the United States, and it's a hard one for American writers to actually face. <laughs> Uh, but I think, you know, easier for you and me in Canada to call it like we see it done and say the United States has no real cards to play here that are meaningful. Janice, we'll have to leave it there. Um, maybe next time, uh, maybe we'll, we'll uh, pick this up next week when we can take a look at how this has developed and maybe we can talk about the Israeli-Palestinian, uh, the latest round of the Israeli-Palestinian peace talks. Um, but uh, for now, we'll have to say goodbye. That's uh, Janice Stein, the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs. Thanks very much, Janice. You know, Dan, it's a pleasure, and I have to say this is one of the most important uh, hinge stories in the modern Middle East that we are seeing unfold before our eyes. Well, we'll definitely keep an eye on it. Thanks again, Janice. You're welcome.